This weekend, gaming companies finally took a stand against the war in Ukraine, but they can do so much more. Good morning. Good Monday morning to you. Let's kick off the week right. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for March 7th, 2022. The show is in our patrons' feeds bright and early every weekday morning and free on our YouTube channel for everyone else. You can find our flagship show, Game Face, by searching your favorite podcast service. You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed you found this. If you're anything like me, and like most of the people I talk to in my day-to-day -day life, you are undoubtedly appalled at what is happening in Ukraine with Putin and Russia invading the country and essentially trying to take it over. I'm not going to get into all the geopolitical stuff that goes along with that, this is a video game podcast after all, and so I want to talk about what the gaming industry is doing to try and help the situation. As I said, more gaming companies threw their weight behind Ukraine this weekend as it tries to stave off the invasion by its neighbor, Russia. Activision suspended new game sales in the territory, while Epic did the same. Essentially, both companies are keeping their games online for play and just turning off transactions. It's not nothing, but it also seems like a huge missed opportunity. Elsewhere, Nintendo placed its eShop in Russia on maintenance mode so that people in the territory could no longer access it. Microsoft also suspended sales of games and its services in Russia. This includes Xbox software and hardware. And EA went a step further. It pulled all its games and virtual currency bundles from Russia and Belarus. But like most of the other gaming companies, it still allows its games to be played online. Now, EA did, prior, take the step of removing Russian teams and other elements from its FIFA and NHL franchises, so this is actually the second change that EA has made to try and do its part. So first of all, I just want to say that it's better than nothing. I saw a list on social media yesterday of all the companies that were doing things like this to try and help Ukraine. And honestly, of the list, probably 2 to 3% were gaming companies. At this point, there's probably 8 or 9 gaming companies that have actually done something. And as you know, there are hundreds, especially now in the day of indie games where you and three of your friends can form a studio and you're a company. So I don't want to dilute what these publishers have done so far, because again, not all of them have done something. I can't think of a single Japanese developer or publisher that has done anything, for example. But I think what we're discovering, now that we've just heaped sanctions and other things on Russia, to try to use finances as a way to change its behavior, is that it's not doing much. In fact, if anything, it seems as if a lot of these financial sanctions are just making Russia double and triple down, increasing the bombings in Ukraine, loading up the troops, surrounding the cities. It really, so far, hasn't deterred Putin from doing much of anything. And again, if anything, it's inflamed him to be worse, if that's even possible. I know that's hard to even fathom honestly. So, while some publishers, U.S. publishers, have stepped up to try to do what they think they can do, I honestly feel like they can do more and they need to do more. For example, Epic. Epic publishes Fortnite. Fortnite is, well, you can debate between Fortnite and Minecraft, or maybe Roblox. But Fortnite is one of the top three most popular games in the world, as far as player counts are concerned, the number of people who are engaging with the game on a daily basis. Now, I do realize that Fortnite's user base does trend a little young, but there are lots of parents, lots of teenagers with esports stars in their eyes that play Fortnite. It's not all kids and preteens. 
So Epic has a huge lever that it can pull, and that lever is cutting off access to Fortnite in Russia. And I don't mean keeping them from buying an umbrella or some goofy outfit that they can put on their character. I mean shutting the servers down so they can't play. Now, I do understand that the knee-jerk reaction to that is... Why would you punish the younger kids and some adults that play it as well for something that Putin is doing? And believe me, if I didn't feel like there was another solution, I would not recommend this solution at all. I do not want to punish people who have very little hand in what Putin is doing. But I feel like I and the world are running out of options. If you've been watching the news coverage from Ukraine and Russia, you've no doubt watched some interviews with Russian citizens. And generally how it works is the younger the person is, the more likely they are to believe that what's happening in Ukraine is really happening. That's where we're at. Russia's state television is essentially the only news that Russia's citizens can get. And... The younger population isn't really tied into it. It's tied into TikTok and Twitter and to a lesser extent, Facebook, social media, Instagram. That's where they get their news. They don't get it from Russian state media, but people over 30 in Russia, almost all of them do. And I watched interview after interview with people in Russia, adults in Russia, who stood there on camera and claimed that All the footage that they've been seeing and all the news coming out of Ukraine is fake. And in fact, some of them even said fake news. How do you reach these people? If they're so brainwashed that they would think that millions, and I'm not exaggerating here, millions and millions of minutes of cell phone footage from Ukraine has somehow been faked by Hollywood, that this is all CGI, the most convincing CGI they've ever seen in their lives. And somebody somewhere just produced hours and hours of it just to fool them. If somebody believes that, how are you going to reach them? That's the question we have right now. Because as I said, the world is running out of ideas on how to stop Putin. I'm running out of ideas on how to stop Putin. And what I've really settled at is because it's the young kids who actually know the truth and believe the truth of what's happening in Ukraine and they're pissed off about it and they're out in the streets protesting, they may be the only ones who can stop this. And how does that happen? Okay, so let's say you have a 17, 18 year old kid in your house and when that kid comes home from school every day, finishes his homework and then he plays Fortnite. That's what he does, that's what he likes to do. What happens when he comes home from school And he can't play Fortnite anymore, or he can't play Rainbow Six Siege anymore, or he can't play Call of Duty Vanguard anymore, or he can't play Battlefield 2042 anymore. What's going to happen? That person is going to get pissed. Who is going to take the brunt of that anger? It's not you or I. It's not the gaming companies. It's their parents, the exact people that need to be reached. So... These people standing in the streets being interviewed by some random journalist from the West telling them, you're crazy, this is really happening. Some of these people have had their own relatives call them from the Ukraine and tell them, this is real, this is really happening, and they still don't believe them. But someone inside the home is a big difference. You have to live with that person all day, every day. Have you ever lived with someone who is perpetually unhappy? Did it change your behavior? I have, and it did. And to me, the only way that this madness is going to stop is if the Russians rise up. And I know it is dangerous to protest in Russia. You could get arrested. In fact, you probably will get arrested. But they can't arrest everybody. Right now, the protests in Russia are relatively small. Still impressive, though. Because it takes a lot of guts to go out on the streets when it's you and a couple thousand people. That they could arrest all of you. But when there's millions in the streets, they can't arrest everyone. They can't put everyone in jail. 
There's not enough jail cells in Russia or all of Eastern Europe to hold all the people that they would try to jail. This, to me, is the only way this ends. It has to come from inside Russia. And there's a reason why the term influencer started in video games. Because we're smart, we're connected, we know what's going on, and we're passionate about it. And we can affect change. So, while it does hurt my heart to say that we have to hurt our brothers and sisters in Russia, our fellow players who just happen to live thousands of miles away, but really think, look, and act just like us, I hate to have to punish them. But I just don't see another way to make it happen. So, I'm proud that some publishers have stepped up and at least tried to do something. And again, I don't want to diminish what they've done, but they can do more. And if we're going to stop Putin, they have to do more. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your SIFs. Elden Ring continues to rumble on like the juggernaut it is. It keeps setting Steam concurrent player records. I believe it's the fifth most popular game in the history of Steam at this point. However, from software, the game's developers have not talked about DLC for the game at all. In fact, a lot of people who are playing it are just praying to get to the end of it. I don't think most players are even worried about DLC right now, but some are. Some people have already finished the game twice, and they're on their third build, and they're, you know, it takes all kinds. And there are people out there who have played this game nonstop since it came out, and are now literally on their third run-through. Those people are worried about DLC, and thank God that they are, because they have uncovered some things in the game that point to at least some semblance of downloadable content post-launch for Elden Ring. Veteran players have uncovered a hidden arena that appears will be used in some way. However, it is not used currently in the game at all. So, some of the biggest players of Elden Ring at this point are assuming that there's going to be some kind of arena DLC in the game, whether that'll be a PvP mode where you go into an arena and fight other Tarnished. Nobody knows yet, but it has to be something. Halo Infinite was finally finished after many years in development and a couple different delays. And since it's been finished, what we've seen is another exodus from developer 343 Industries. Andrew Witz is Halo Infinite's multiplayer lead, and he announced this weekend that he is leaving the studio and he doesn't even have a new job. He's taking time off to quote unquote recharge. I can't say I blame him, but he has only worked at 343 for three years, which means he burnt out extremely quickly. There have been many casualties of the Halo Infinite development team, the lead narrative designer left in January, while the studio lost two lead directors during the course of developing the game. There's crunch, there's rumors about unhealthy work environments. We've seen all that stuff from a number of studios, but I cannot remember in recent memory another studio that lost so many key employees through the course of development and once development was finished. Certainly these resignations ring out through the industry and could become a challenge for 343 Industries to collect talent. In related news, 343 recently confirmed that it needs more time to work on the four-player cooperative campaign and the Forge mode. So therefore, cooperative missions will not be available in May as we had hoped. 343 is working on both that and Season 2 content at the same time. It's a big load for a team coming off a long development cycle. And speaking of Season 2, it's called Lone Wolves, and it's set to launch May 3rd with new maps, modes, and more. Gotham Knights has been one of those games that has been delayed a couple times, and we haven't seen a whole lot of it since its official debut, which has led a lot of people to think it's just been in development hell. There have been stories about developers who have worked on the game who left or were accused of harassing co-workers. It's been a messy game in general while it's been in development. But it does appear that finally the game is going to be released. Now remember, it is a cooperative game that you play with others online. This weekend, 
a Gotham Knights playtest appeared briefly on Steam, meaning that there's a group of people somewhere playing Gotham Knights in alpha or beta form. Some early form of the game is being played by some unnamed group of people. This is a great sign that Gotham Knights is actually releasing this year, as WB Games has contended. The publisher has not shared any word on when or if this alpha or beta will ever be released to the general public, but if they have a beta going this early in the year, it's undoubtedly releasing in 2022. Remember Lost Ark? It's that Diablo-like MMORPG that everyone was playing, or at least everyone thought everyone was playing a couple weeks ago. It's Amazon's second release in 2022, and it was leaps and bounds more popular than its last game, New World, which actually did quite well for itself to boot. But Lost Ark left it in the dust, or at least we thought it left it in the dust. This weekend, Amazon announced that Lost Ark has banned over a million bot accounts in order to reduce server waiting time. So I'm not sure if this was a ploy by the publisher to pump the game's tires so everyone would get in on the game thinking that it's the hot new thing, FOMO can be powerful, people. Believe me. Or if the game was just under siege by some nefarious actor who was trying to make the experience as bad as possible. What seems more likely to you? <laughs> But ultimately, it appears as if the strategy backfired because people who really wanted to play the game could not play the game because the bot accounts were taking up spots in the queue. It appears that Amazon and the game's developer has decided that it might be a better idea to get people who will actually spend money into the game. It will be interesting to see if someone like Jason Schreier tries to dig up some dirt on exactly how or why this happened. I'm guessing some of you this weekend have been playing Gran Turismo 7, the brand new PlayStation exclusive driving simulation. It's received great reviews. Its Metacritic is sitting at about an 8.8, .8, and we'll talk about it tomorrow on Game Face. For the most part, the opening weekend for the game has been fairly issue-free. No reports of servers crashing, or people waiting to get into play, or the game crashing, or horrible bugs, or any of that. But what has materialized over the weekend is that the game is a little bit shady when it comes to microtransactions. Instead of buying cars directly, like in Gran Turismo Sport, which was the spin-off that was released right before this one, you have to buy credits. And equivalent cars are vastly more expensive. For two bucks, you get 100,000 credits. Or you can spend around 15 bucks, 16 bucks for 2 million credits. After you complete the game, it shifts focus to earning credits to purchase the more desirable cars. The supercars, the classic cars, that type of stuff. Unlike prior games in the series, you can't sell the cars in your collection to help earn credits. For example, a 1929 Mercedes-Benz S. Barker Tourer, spotted in a trailer for Gran Turismo 7, cost 20 million credits. So do the math on that. If you're getting 2 million credits for 16 bucks, and the car cost 20 million credits, that car would ultimately cost around $150 of real money if you bought it with microtransactions. You can probably go on Amazon and buy a real car for that from China. <laughs> so while everything seems all good with Gran Turismo, as far as how the game plays and the content that's actually in the game, if you want to expand your livery, you're going to have to pay. In a story that highlights why announcing games way too early can often be a huge mistake, it was revealed this weekend that Star Wars Eclipse from Studio Quantic Dream might still be six years away from launch. The studio is having hiring issues. There are 60 positions that have remained unfilled for three months now. Translation, people simply don't want to work at Quantic Dream. You may wonder why. Well, Quantic Dream has been mired in a lawsuit for the last couple years over sexual harassment and other workplace issues. And apparently, regardless of whether Quantic Dream has won those cases or not, it has soured its reputation in the industry. It just goes to show you that your reputation in any industry is extremely important.
Okay, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. So I've been playing a Switch exclusive strategy game called Triangle Strategy over the weekend. It's an enjoyable strategy RPG as far as the systems are concerned and the combat, how it works. It's a typical grid based system, but there are some small tweaks in how the combat works that provide at least a couple extra layers of strategy. Overall, I'm enjoying it for the most part. Um, I believe it's sitting at like an 8.3 Metacritic roughly right now. So while I've enjoyed playing the game, I haven't exactly enjoyed looking at the game. Now, hold on, hear me out. I know some of you love the art style that Art Dink uses in its games because it's the same. So Art Dink has an RPG franchise called Octopath Traveler. It has the same exact art style as this game, as Triangle Strategy. And I know some people really like it. It's this weird kind of hazy sprite look. In an Octopath Traveler, they, they did some pretty cool stuff with like some overlays to give the 2D graphics depth. It, it's not just the 2D game, but really it is. It looks great sitting still but there's not much effort put into things once it starts moving. A lot of the characters have two-frame animations. The screen is basically static. Nothing on the screen is hardly ever moving at all. It's like Art Dink established the good look for their games and then just gave up. As I said, we saw the same thing with its RPG franchise, Octopath Traveler. It's something... I would expect from a team of two people working in a garage, not something funded by a major publisher, and in this case, Square Enix. Adding insult to injury, it's a full-priced $60 game. If it were from those same two people in a garage, it would be 20 bucks. So what I want to ask here is, 2D, a cheap and easy way out for game developers? Now I know it's a necessity for some, if you're those two guys working in a garage, there's no way you're going to build a 3D game using Unreal Engine or Unity or whatever. It's just, it's not feasible. You could do it, your game would look terrible, and your game would probably play terrible too. So I do understand that 2D visuals are a necessity for smaller studios, but when big publishers like Square Enix release 2D games that don't do anything special with the medium, it's mostly a cost-cutting measure. The days of games like Donkey Kong Country really taking 2D visuals and the hardware that they were given to create those 2D visuals and squeezing every last ounce out of them are over. And why is that? Because it's no longer a necessity to make games in 2D. Back then, it's all Rare had. And so it was going to get as much out of it as it could. And it did. It was impressive what Rare did with the Super Nintendo and a handful of other developers, to be honest. Back then, developers would write to the metal to make 2D games look amazing, not just 3D games. It just appears that the vast majority of indie developers are satisfied these days with good enough or just a frame rate that doesn't stutter. Now, there are exceptions, and the biggest exception to that is Cuphead. And honestly, Cuphead is a bar that all 2D games should be trying to meet. But at the same time, it was delayed multiple times. Didn't seem to hurt it when it finally came out. There are some others that really do a good job with 2D and really push the medium. Ori and the Will of the Wisp, Ori and the Blind Forest, both those games, stunning 2D games. You can see a lot of work went into them. Also games that have been delayed in the past. There's Hollow Knight. There's Don't Starve. Fighting games used to be a bastion of amazing 2D graphics, but even some of the stalwarts like the King of Fighters have moved to polygonal visuals. At least there are still some games like Skullgirls and Blaze Blue to fill in some of the holes, though. Vanillaware used to create stunning 2D games, but the point I'm getting at 
is that I can point out the few exceptions off the top of my head. That means there's a problem. 2D games can be just as visually arresting as any 3D game if effort and skill are used in equal measure. To me, there's very little excuse for small indie developers to not be pushing the envelope and literally no excuse at all for publishers like Square Enix. So this isn't a rant about how 2D graphics suck. I was reared on 2D. I've spent more time playing 2D games in my life than I have spent playing 3D, and I don't think it's even close. So I'm not a 2D graphics hater. I'm just looking at it like, okay, here I am sitting 30 years later, and I'm not seeing as much innovation on the 2D front as I feel like I should be seeing. So here's to those who push the boundaries of 2D visuals, and here's a smack in the ass for those who don't. Are there any genres you prefer to play in 2D? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield, and you can do what the cool kids do and follow me on Twitter at Dinfire. And while you're at it, follow Sifted at Sifted Games, and then head on over to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, but until then, make sure you seize today, because there will never be another. <laughs>